I feel like we haven't heard too much from the social sciences today, and so um, let me do what I can to sort of make an entry there. Um, basically, um, I want to start by making a sort of fairly trivial, obvious observation, perhaps, that um, the fact that companies have now adopted information technology, uh, what they're doing now slowly is generating a record, a digital record of human behavior uh, this was observed already back in the day, going back to the very earliest catalog uh, marketers, where you know, back then people pointed out that, well, this is kind of interesting because this sort of generates a, a uh, insights into what people like, people's habits, uh, preferences, and attitudes. This idea that a transaction in itself generates almost like a fossil record that we can now go back and learn from. And of course now, you know, you know, we have all these new technologies that, you know, the scale has just improved dramatically. And so uh, a lot of this uh, activity is, it's, you know, it's, it's completely mundane in nature. You know, web transactions, Twitter feeds, as we've seen earlier, uh, when you buy stuff from Amazon and so on. But, but the point is that, you know, this is, is incredibly valuable data that in the social sciences and other fields we should start, start to sort of take seriously. Um, in the interest of time, let me just talk about one particular uh, aspect, which is going to be in um, uh, psychology and decision making, and basically make the following thesis that a you know, when you observe a large number of decision makers, even in trivial mundane tasks, it tells us something about who they are, their values, their ideologies, and their traits. And so sort of pushing this one step forth further, we can start talking about now doing big data psychology. Uh, I feel like I should have at least one slide that said big data, and here it is. Um, of course, in psychology, the traditional uh, methodology has been experimental lab studies with a small number of human subjects. Um, lots of interesting findings there. Those studies are great. But now we can complement them with these analyzing these transactional databases and see sort of, do we get something similar? Do we get something different? Uh, since I don't have a lot of time, let me just talk about one thing that we've looked at, which is the effects of aging on decision making. So what happens as you get older to you as a decision maker? There's a whole bunch of interesting findings that has come out from the lab, running these small scale lab studies. So things like that in general we suffer a decline in fluid intelligence, fluid cognition. That is, we get worse at inductive and deductive reasoning when solving novel tasks. We tend, as we get older, to attach less importance to novelty. We prefer to sort of deepen existing relationships versus forming new ones. We become more risk averse. Uh, there's some recent evidence from neuroscience to suggest that, in fact, there's also gender effects here uh, studies have suggested that the female brain is less susceptible to some of these cognitive declines than the male brain. Um, uh, it's even been argued that you know, the female brain, as we get older, is roughly 10 years younger than the male brain. Just lots of interesting insights there. Is this actually something we can see when we study these, what we might call mundane activities? Monitoring activity or behavior for hundreds of thousands of decision makers. Do we see these psychological effects showing in when we watch people make decisions? Um, here's one of the most mundane things I can imagine, which is going to the grocery store. Um, so say we took a large database of decision makers. In this case, we have over hundreds of thousands of US households where we can observe over multiple years what they buy at the grocery store. Everything, every single transaction in every product category, what they buy over multiple years for the same household for hundreds of thousands of households. What might we learn from that? Does that map onto what we have found in the lab? Now, to do something like that, you first have to define some behavioral measures that kind of map onto these theoretical constructs. And so you can start to do things like, well, suppose I want to study habits. Well, one, one way in which we can define a habit, there's different ways, but one way is to take a product category, take your entire spending, your entire expenditure in that product category, and then see how much of that, how big a fraction of that goes to your number one choice. So how concentrated is your decision on just one thing? 
If that's large, it's, it's, it's evidence that you're sort of crystallized or fossilized in that decision making. You keep buying the same thing over and over. Uh, we can define measures of novelty seeking, like uh, the extent to which you buy new products launch, launched in the market. We can define measures of risk aversion. Um, there are studies that suggest that consumers perceive over-the-counter generic drugs as lower quality and more risky than their branded counterparts. So if we actually now study decision makers at different points in the life cycle, is it true that as they get older, they become more likely to buy nationally branded uh, drugs versus generic drugs or not? Does the same thing happen in other categories where there's private label and national brand? Now, how do these, uh, how do uh, different decision makers, uh, how does it break down when we look at this behavior uh, across age and gender? So let me just briefly, since I'm running out of time, just talk about a few of the results. First of all, we find huge gender effects. Male, so households that are run by a male, are much more concentrated in their decision making than female run households. Um, furthermore, old males become much more concentrated in their decision making than young males. This happens in particular in product categories where decisions are hard, large categories that you have to buy frequently. This is in those very categories where we see old males just start doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, interestingly enough, you don't find this for female households. It's completely flat. They don't seem to have this increase in choice concentration as they get older. So again, there's multiple explanations of this, but it's at least consistent with some of these things like that's coming out of the lab. Uh, we also find evidence that old, uh, old households are, become more risk averse when measured as this uh, propensity to buying uh, generics versus nationally branded drugs. We don't see that for other product categories. The propensity to buy private labels stays flat, but for, for over-the-counter medicine, people become much more likely to buy nationally branded drugs uh, as they get older. Lots of other areas in which to start sort of thinking about big data psychology, and this is just one of them. Um, and I would love to talk more about offline. In general, I think this is a, a tremendous uh, avenue for studying effects, company data. And companies are sometimes willing to share their data, sometimes they're not. Uh, it's a little bit of trial and error. But, you know, I highly recommend sort of looking at some of these things. Thank you very much. Question, why, why don't you stay up here for a minute? We'll take one, one question. I think we have time. Do we have time for one question? Great. How many of you are wondering, based on how you shop, if you fit those <laughs> statistics? I am. <laughs> I know what you're doing in the store, so. No questions? No questions. OK. Come on, wake up, people. Good, Mike, go for it. Yeah, so, so this is actually the data that's been collected by a third party research company that has then generously made it available to me. Essentially, this database we're working with here, is, it's 100, roughly 100,000 US households observed from three to six years in about three or 400 product categories. Um, so I wouldn't call it it's not massive big data, it's medium big data perhaps. Uh, but in general, I mean, as I'm sure you know, Mike, I mean, these, these uh, enterprise databases, they can be massive. And so um, at, the, at some point, uh, as companies become more willing to share them, um, there, there are going to be logistical issues involved in actually using them. Uh, I'm not sure we're quite there yet because companies, for obvious reasons, are quite reluctant to share it sometimes. Um, but um, but for this particular data set, that, that really wasn't an issue. Bob, on. Yep. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think so. So here's here's my impression that there is general. There's, there's definitely a trend towards companies being more interested in using data analytics. There's no doubt about it, and that almost forces them to be more forthcoming because they have to bring us researchers into their fold, so to speak. So in that case, yes. On the other hand, they are still very, very paranoid about data leaving their organization for understandable reasons. So 
Um, it's something I spend, a I spend a lot of time banging my head against the wall dealing with it, but that's just the nature of the beast, I guess.